Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight and our topic. The topic, first of all, is Dubrovnik plagues and quarantine in the 14th and 15th century. And we're greatly blessed because our speaker is a Kiwi, but a Croatian Kiwi, Croatian-born Kiwi from Dubrovnik. Actually, not from Dubrovnik, but she'll correct me on that, I'm sure. But our speaker is Mirjana Moffat. She is certainly from that region, and she's presenting her original research in regard to what she's going to be talking about. So please welcome Mirjana Moffat. Salvete omnes. Nomen mihi Mirjana est. Gratias a govobis cum hic veneritis hac vespera. Nun cloquar de ragusa de peste en cura sanitatis in seculo quarto decimo. Incipiamus. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa, dobra večer i dobra došli. I believe this was not a usual greeting that you normally get at these public speeches. But with, in mind with the whole um, lecture, I just wanted to give you a little flavor of what it would have probably been like in the 14th century. All of you who watched or who attended my lecture last year on the Monroes and the special collection that we have here at the University of Otago might have wondered, what do I have in common with the Black Plague? Well, I do love the Monroes, but my love for the Black Plague, I know it sounds weird, dates back to my early childhood. When I noticed a statue or a sort of a monument remembrance uh, to the sand rock in my neighborhood. Later on, I learned that whenever there was a dedication statue, if I may call, uh, in a particular place of uh, Saint Roche or Saint Sebastian, that meant that there was Black Plague. Later on, I got much more interested in the plague and it's been now a good decade and a half that I've been reading, researching, exploring and writing about the Black Plague. So what prompted me to do the quarantine lecture? Well, it was the lockdown during the COVID times when we had no freedom of movement and when we were actually in panic, the worldwide. And I thought from the lockdown perspective, gosh, are we going to travel again? When it is going to be? How is it going to be like? And last year I happened to be in Europe. And of course, I couldn't resist but going to beautiful Dubrovnik. And it is beautiful. Now, without further ado, I would li like us to get cracking. Okay, so, Maestro, thank you. Lost the video, can we? Are we good? May I start? Okay, so just to let you know, this is the proclamation of the quarantine from the 1377, and it was done on the 27th of July. And do you believe in coincidences? Well, I do, because I happened to be in Dubrovnik last year on the 27th of July, and I was in Lazaretto on the very same day. So destiny, coincidence, whatever, it was lovely. Okay. So, we can't talk about the Black Plague, Dubrovnik, anything without getting the first overview of 
what was the world and Europe before the plague. So plagues have existed throughout the history. Uh, in the Iliad, whoever read it, you will probably recognize the part. Homer describes the plague during the Trojan War. There was the plague of Athens. Uh, it was in 430 before Christ. And actually that plague originated in Ethiopia. It spread to Greece, Dalmatia and Rome. And from that period, we know that Hippocrates also explained the basics of the infectious diseases. In those days, they believed that it was miasma or miasma coming from the Greek word, which meant air pollution. And then the plagues followed. So there were two plagues in Rome and Rome is of particular importance for us. The, uh, 365 BC, 314 BC. And then we come to the Jesus time, AD, Anno Domini, with the Justinian plague. And um, it was for eight years on and off from uh, 541 to 549. And I think it was the Procopius from Caesarea who was the first one to describe the boils, the pus filled boils. Okay. So again, how come that there was such a devastating plague in the 14th century? Well, let's go back to the 12th and the 13th century. I love those centuries. So the 12th century was like a sort of a middle age renaissance. The first universities were established then. We've got the Bologna in 1088, but the School of Medicine was established, I think, uh, at in 1125. Then we've got Paris, we've got Oxford. And since that time, only the qualified doctors were allowed to, uh, uh, to be in practice. Uh, there was a, a major change in approach to their medicine. Before, uh, whoever was sick, their relatives would take the sample of their urine, take them to the doctor's practice, and based on that urine, he would say what was wrong. So that was from bed to bench medicine. Actually, in the 12th century, that approach changes. And so it was the doctors who went to see the patients in person. So from bench to bed. 13th century is absolutely lovely century. There is so much abundance. There is economic growth. There is increasing number of citizens. There is agriculture, abundance of food, everything, trade, shipbuilding. So before they were sailing only in summer season. As of that time, they are building bigger and stronger ships so that they can sail even in winter time. The climate was good, but that spoils everything. We get to the 14th century and there are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We've got the climate change uh, called a little ice age at the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, there was a climate change, change that caused the great famine for two years from 1315 to 1317. And there were a long periods of heavy rain and low temperatures and the population didn't start to increase until 1325. Of course, great mortality caused by famine, malnutrition and weak immunity. And then we get to only three years before the poor crop harvest in Italy from 1345 until 1348. And Italy was already plagued from I would say June 1347. So it was a really bad year. There is a lot to read about, a lot to go through. So these are all my, just my books, just a very small collection of my books, but there is a lot, a lot more, a lot of articles. And when I went to Dubrovnik, I was actually so warmly welcomed by the staff at the Dubrovnik Archive, Dubrovnik State Archive, and by the Lazaretto uh, lady in charge. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to Ivona Zoran and their director, Nikolina Pozniak, as well as Zrinka Lucianovic from the Dubrovnik Heritage. They have been amazing support. 
I had the opportunity to touch with my own hands the originals of the wills and testaments of the 1348. I can't tell you how, how much my heart was beating. And as I said in my introduction, this is the photo of the original uh, proclamation of the quarantine. When we talk about the plague time, I'm not going into what causes the plague. I will just very briefly inform you that there are three types of plague. Bubonic, which is usually the summertime. Um, pneumonic occurs in winter and septicemia that is 100% lethal. It can, it can occur anytime. Now with bubonic, the survival rate was the highest. With the pneumonic, it was much lower because it's winter. So it was a tough one. And as I said, septicemia, no way. There are still debates of what causes it. There is a strong um, ad advocating that it was Yersinia pestis the cause, but recently there have been some, uh, there have been some, um, uh, scientific researches, I think it was from Scotland, where they um, mentioned that all the symptoms that people were uh, showing during the Black Plague period uh, looked like hemorrhagic fever, hence it might be the viral etiology. So there are still debates. But what is certain that in the 14th century, the doctors believed the, co the cause of plague was corrupted air, and it was not an infectious disease. This is the map of Dubrovnik. I just would like to show you a little bit of when we talk about Dubrovnik and Dubrovnik Republic, uh, how large it was. So here we see Dubrovnik, this, the city, and a neighboring area. These are the islands, these small islands just in front of Dubrovnik. They will be later, they were mainly unpopulated and they will be later uh, used for the first quarantines. Here we've got the old town of Tsavtat. Sorry, this is Tsavtat. It will also serve as one of the first quarantines. And here we've got the island of Mnet. And here we've got the island of, Mnast, uh, of Lastovo. Sorry. Um, there were some more, uh, uh, more islands th that were encompassed in that Dubrovnik uh, Republika Ragusa of the Dubrovnik Republic, but we will now concentrate more on the Dubrovnik itself. So this is the city map of Dubrovnik, and it was of great help to me to know when I was there how to orientate myself. So, and it is important also for those people who are coming either from the west or from the east. So this is the old city. This western part, it's called Pile. So here it is the entrance into the, there is a huge gate and this is the Pile gate, the eastern one. So here would people come, whoever was coming, I don't know, from Bosnia, uh, from the, the other parts of Dalmatia or from the western part of the Adriatic Sea. Here, this part, is called Ploce because there is a Ploce gate. And this is important for the Lazaretto, the um, uh, 17th century Lazaretto that we see them uh, even in today's form. So this was for all the merchants who were coming from the East. So whenever we talk about the Dubrovnik, we either talk about Ploce side or we talk about Pile side. So that will be important later to understand what the first quarantines, where, where the first quarantines were located. Okay, so who lived in Dubrovnik? We had nobles, we had city dwellers, people who lived in the town, and we had people who lived in the around the rural population. Unfortunately, there are no precise, um, th there is no precise number of the population because there was no census in that time. Uh, Ravančić in his book, Gordon, Gordon Ravančić, in his book, Time of Dying, Dubrovnik in the Time of the Black Plague, which he refers to that 1348, he says that in town, 61 noblemen died 
and 167 noblemen survived, which gives the ratio one to three, one dead, three survived. However, Liber Statutorum from the 15th century says that there were about, excuse me, 25 people that died in the period 1348 to 1374. Now, this is just a very general overview of what the healthcare system in the 14th century looked like. So it does begin in the 13, very early 1300, in 1301. Um, uh, there were 44 physicians and surgeons in service throughout the 14th century. As of 1300, the first one that is recorded appears in 1300. And there were 32 in the 15th century. So there is the difference between who was a physician, who was a physician, surgicus, but we will, um, chirurgicus, but we will talk about that in a minute. Now, then in 1306, the leprosorium was uh, established, so that was for lepra uh, patients or lepra people. Um, it was outside the city. In 1317, uh, Little Brothers or Malabracha Pharmacy was established. This was the third in Europe, but it is the first, the still the longest running pharmacy in the world. It's still, it's still operating and it is located in the Franciscan monastery. Then in 1347, just a year before the onset of the Black Plague, we've got the uh, establishment of the Elmshaus Domus Christi. And as I said already, 27 July 1377 is proclamation of the quarantine. And we can see it in Liber Viridis, which is the green, uh, the green book on foil 78, section 49. In 1319, so 13 years after the proclamation of the quarantine, we have the appointment of the three noblemen known as plague officers. Um, in 1395, they are called Katsamorti. Now, what I find really interesting is they appointed their noblemen to organize, to sort, to manage who can enter or who cannot. Uh, can you imagine our politicians to go to the front line and to be uh, uh, the, 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 the first point of contact in times of trouble? Mm, right, sorry, sorry for, to the politicians. And now I've got a beautiful documentary about magnificent Dubrovnik. Oh, I love Dubrovnik. However, I am doing the Master of Science Communication and I would not be, a, I believe, a good science communicator if I wouldn't do something different. So whenever I talk about Dubrovnik, I absolutely love it and it is magnificent. But we are talking here about the times of plague. And so I wanted to give you a little twist and I wanted to give you a little discomfort. And I want you to feel what it would have been like if the plague if you were at the times of plague, would you be disturbed? What would happen? And I try to play, play with dynamics. So you will see what I mean. And if you are uh, irritated, if you are upset, that's good. That means that I made my point. But let's go to beautiful Dubrovnik. Maestro. And I hope you will enjoy it because um, just, just one more thing to say, uh, don't worry, everything sta starts nice and smooth and slow. Like in times before the plague, like that 13th century, everything is so calm. Enjoy. Dubrovnik, a gem in the Adriatic Sea, has a rich history, whether it is maritime economy, trade or diplomacy. What drew me to this beautiful city was their healthcare system, or better to say, the origins of their healthcare system. It all started with the onset of the Black Plague in 1348. Several more plagues followed, which prompted the authorities in Dubrovnik to do something about it. And they did. In 1377, they promulgated the rule of quarantine, and not only that, 
they established public health offices to ensure that everybody respected the quarantine rules and also to organize the healthcare system in the worst of times. In 1205, Dubrovnik became a tributary of the Venetian Republic until 1358. However, during that time, Dubrovnik was operating as an independent state. Its governing body consisted of the Grand or Major Council, the Small or Minor Council, the Petitioner's Council or Senate, and a Rector. Although the society consisted of noblemen, city dwellers and rural populace, only the noblemen could govern the state. The Rector's Palace provided offices for the state and government officials. The rector was elected on a monthly basis, during which time he worked and lived in the palace. The grand or major council consisted of the local noblemen. It had legislative power and it was their responsibility to elect a new rector every month. The small or minor council had the executive power. It initially consisted of 11 councillors and a rector, whose number decreased over time to 6 councillors and the rector. It implemented the laws and decisions of the grand council and later the senate. The Senate or Petitioner's Council had the authority over decision-making in foreign and domestic policies. The supreme and founding legal document, the Statute, dates back to 1272. It consisted of eight books of laws, amendments and regulations of the Republic. Over the centuries it was in use and expanded until the fall of the Republic in 1808. While still under the rule of the Venetian Republic, Dubrovnik was not just a city, but encompassed neighbouring land and islands which were purchased from the kingdoms in the region. The islands were of particular importance as the first plague quarantine locations. Dubrovnik was not spared by the 1348 plague, a plague that would swiftly make its way to other parts of Europe too over the next four years. Historians, chroniclers and researchers are not uniform in their account of the number of dead, but the figure is surely high. In some places the plague lasted only a short period of time, Records from Perpignan in France show the plague started in mid-April and by late June the citizens had resumed their normal daily activities only two and a half months from the start of the plague. In Dubrovnik the plague lasted for six months. During this time at least 100 noblemen and several thousand commoners died. Who died? And do we know anything about these people at all? We're better to find the answers than in a place that was a witness of the time, the Sponza Palace. Currently home to the Brovnik State Archive, the building has been through several physical transformations and uses throughout its history. Located in the heart of town, the building first served as the Great Customs House back in the 13th century. It is recorded in the updated Statute of 1296 as one of the government-owned buildings. Economic expansion called for the extension of the available storage space in the early 16th century, the city council voted in favour of building a new customs house called Devona. The construction took four years and was finished in 1520. Built in a Gothic Renaissance style, the new space housed the state mint, armoury, goldsmiths' workshops and served as a place for rainwater collection, Sponza, after which the palace is named. Dubrovnik State Archive holds an original 1348 book of notary wills and testaments Testamenta Notare 10-1 Volume 5. All the wills and testaments are in Latin. There are approximately 300 wills of various length and content. Apart from the obvious heir and successor and the amount of inheritance, goods and property, many wills state not only the fear of dying but fear of God's punishment. In many wills a great part of their wealth is given to the church and monasteries as payment for the redemption of their souls but there are not very many mentions of the almshouse or the poor. Given the high mortality rate during the plague, people were encouraged to leave a will, especially the nobles. The folio 24 contains the will of Lena, daughter of Nicola de Menza, made on 21 March 1348. I, Lena, the daughter of Nicola de Menza, hereby make my first and the last testament. I would like my brother, Maro, to have all the rights and the parts I am entitled to from my father and mother, be his and nobody else's, without asking questions, and for my soul to be given, if my brother Maro is willing to, three hyperperi for the tithe and the administrative church officials, Brumisiria. I, Presbyter Laurentius, am the witness. 
I parle of P. Shirai and the witness. What was the healthcare system in the 14th century like? The establishment of the first universities in the 12th century enabled medical practice to develop further. The first faculty of medicine was founded at the University of Bologna in Italy in 1158. Medical schools of Padua, Montpellier, Salerno and Paris were among the most famous for their medical training. Although the initial teachings were based on reading and discussing the classical texts only, practical tutorials were introduced in the 13th and 14th centuries. Given the strong church influence on the universities, all the syllabi had to be approved by the church. The training took a total of seven years, three years of general training in astronomy, philosophy and logic, followed by four years of studying medical texts by Avicenna, Galen and Hippocrates. The graduates had the degree of Medicus Physicus, but before they were licensed to run their practice, they had to do a six-month internship and pass the final examination before a professional board. In the 13th century, medicine and surgery were separated. Medicine was more theoretical and surgery practical. The surgeons were mainly called Medicus Chirurgicus, but also Medicus Pestus. Little is known about the activities of the physicians during the 1348 Black Plague in Dubrovnik, but the surgeons were the main ones treating the plague disease. The healthcare system in Dubrovnik dates back to 1301. Dubrovnik was the third city to open a pharmacy. It was in the Franciscan Monastery in 1317 called the Little Brothers. It is the longest continuously running pharmacy to this day. In 1347, just a year before the Black Plague, an almshouse, Domus Christi, was founded to treat the poor and sick. The government of Dubrovnik employed two qualified medical doctors, two surgeons, two barbers or army surgeons, and two to three pharmacists or speciari. They all received a salary, hence the name salariati. The minor council's emissary, called syndico, would travel to Italy, mainly to medical university cities, and recruit physicians to work in Dubrovnik. The contract was usually signed for one to two years, but there were some who stayed for several years. Once officially employed by the government, the physicians and the surgeons were treating all the citizens of Dubrovnik without charge. They were allowed to take money only of treating foreigners or those in the countryside. It was often the case that Dubrovnik physicians were sent abroad to treat neighbouring rulers or nobility, developing diplomatic service and provision of political information to the Dubrovnik government. Medical graduates were very respected and well paid, although there was a shortage during the plagues, and plague infested areas were not a go to career destination. The salary offered was attractive even to surgeons who earned half the salary of a physician. The 14th and 15th century did not have a treatment for the plague. Theriac was universally the most prescribed drug with very little or no effect. The best advice that physicians gave the patients in the plague time was to run as soon as possible and not return for a long time. Having survived the Black Plague, Dubrovnik city-state tried to recover and return to normal life. Things were looking good for the economy and the political situation was promising, which could not be said for the Venetian Republic, who lost all the islands and Dalmatian coast in 1358. After 153 years under the Venetians, Dubrovnik was finally free from their influence and became a republic in its own right. The new republic acknowledged the authority of the Hungarian and Croatian king, Louis I, but maintained its independence through its economic and diplomatic skills. Dubrovnik agreed to pay the new sovereign the annual sum of 500 ducats and would provide seafaring support in case of war. That very same year, 1358, Dubrovnik suffered another plague, lasting a year. It seemed that the plague troubles were not over, as the next 15 years saw new plague waves in 1361, 1363, 1371 and 1374. Having experienced frequent occurrences of the plague, the government decided to put an end to it. Thus, the idea of quarantine was born. The Green Book, or Liber Viridis, is of particular importance because on folio 78, the section 49 starts with Venians de locis pestiferis non intret regusium vel districtum, referring to the quarantine regulation. And here is the full text. Those who arrive from plague-infested locations must not enter Ragusium or the district. In the same year, 1377, on the 27th of July, the Grand Council assembled, as per custom, with 47 councillors present. 
It was taken and confirmed by 34 councillors that both the natives and those arriving from plague-infested locations should not be received into Aguzium or its districts unless they first stood to purify themselves in Makana or in the Old City for one month. Additionally, 44 councillors of the same council decided that anyone from Aguzia or its districts who dares or presumes to go to those arriving from plague-infested locations and are in confinement in Makana or the Old City will face a penalty of being detained there for one month. People who do carry provisions or other necessities to those in confinement without the permission of the authorised officials will be penalised by confinement of one month. It was also taken and confirmed by 29 councillors of the same council that whoever did not observe the aforestated or any of the aforestated must pay the penalty of 50 hyperperi and is bound to observe the aforestated. Since no treatment for the plague was known in the 14th century, the introduction of quarantine was aimed at containing the spread of the infection without disrupting the trade of goods by sea or land. Dubrovnik did not have arable land for growing food, so it relied heavily on its buying power. Having experienced frequent outbreaks of the plague, the citizens were aware that it was very contagious and one could easily get infected by touching goods arriving from the plague-infested areas. In June 1390, the Grand Council instructed the small council and the rector to appoint plague officers to prevent all arrivals from plague-infested locations from entering the city. They were also authorised to act if these restrictions were violated. The small council appointed three noblemen to serve in the role for a year. They were to ensure that all incomers stayed out of the Dubrovnik region for 15 days. If they disobeyed, they could be fined up to 100 ducats. If they failed to pay, they could be whipped. In 1395, the number of play officers increased to six, and the new term of Katsumurti was registered. Two years later, the small council had the authority to appoint as many plague officials as necessary, depending on the severity of the situation. In 1413, the public health officers are called officialis katsumotuorum, while that name changes in the 16th century to health officers. In 1426, a regulation was adopted on the election of katsumurti, as they were called in Dubrovnik, whereby whomever was performing this duty was to do it per angarim meaning it was mandatory and on a minimum wage. By then the public health service consisted of three to five katsumorti, a plague doctor, an administrator, a priest, cleaning ladies, grave diggers and a surgeon. The mandatory stay in quarantine was 30 days, but katsumorti had the authority to extend it to 40 days if they saw necessary. They were to be informed by local noblemen if there was a plague outbreak anywhere in the state and to act promptly. Two small ships were vigilant in case an incoming ship would attempt to enter the port without permission. In 1457, two Katsumorti commoners were in service in places outside Dubrovnik. After the promulgation of quarantine in 1377, ships and merchants arriving in Dubrovnik were to spend 30 days in the nearby islands of Mekan, Supata or Bobura. These islands were unpopulated so were perfect to keep them away from locals. Should those islands become overcrowded, the overflow were to be quarantined in the neighbouring town of Tsavta. Later, the quarantine was extended to the islands of Lokrum and Miet. If people were arriving from the continent, they were quarantined at the peninsula of Danche, to the west of the city walls. To ensure that those in confinement at Danche stayed in isolation, a long two metre high wall was built to separate the entire peninsula from the mainland. The special buildings for a 40 day confinement were called Lazaretos. Danche Lazaretto was built in 1430. It consisted of wooden barracks. In mid-15th century, more solid buildings were erected, including additional amenities such as a well, a church, houses for families suspected of being plague-infected, and a cemetery. Plagues continued, so did the improvement and building of new lazarettos. In the late 16th century, the Senate decided to build Lazaretto a Ploche to the east of the city walls, but its construction did not start until 1627 and was completed 15 years later in 1642. Ploche Lazaretto consisted of five units, a set of ten houses connected with five courtyards and side naves. Each house had its number and it was counted from the east. The main entrance is on the west side of the entire complex at street level. The principal courtyard is connected to the unit courtyards via stairs and the unit courtyards are linked to the lateral rectangular naves. People lived in their houses at street level while the goods were stored in the naves. The head of Plotcha Lazaretto, called Captain, resided in the Lazaretto on a permanent basis. 
He was in charge of organising travellers' accommodation and ensuring all the goods were well aired and decontaminated. One of the best friends for those in quarantine was Draft, because they believed that fresh air coming from various sides helped in decontamination. The captain oversaw that all the necessary data was recorded. Who arrived? How did they arrive? Where were they arriving from? Any goods they brought with them? And what quarantine house number they were allocated? Etc. The current Lazaretto complex was renovated by Dubrovnik County between 2012 and 2019. It is now the creative hub of Dubrovnik with many exhibitions, including a COVID-19 one, concerts, art and craft workshops, and even a cafe. It is an attractive destination and testimony to Dubrovnik's smart way of dealing with plagues and keeping the population healthy and prosperous. And to end this story, I think of no better way than to hear it from one of Dubrovnik's local artists. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you are not too cross with me with all that shaking of the of the shoots. So I thought aha uh -huh. the moment you relax and you see nice beautiful scene, and then it goes fast and it and you can't follow and so and that's how I picture the situation might have been like in the times of the black plague because I have um, I think I have count oh. thank you um, I think I have counted that from 1348 until the end of the 14th century there were seven outbreaks of the plague so not a small number in 50 years. I'm aware of time. So when we talk about the healthcare system and we see this photo, we immediately think of the plague doctor, but don't be mistaken, uh, it's not happening until the 17th century. So this is not the 14th century black plague doctor, sorry. Okay, fuge cito, fuge longe, tarde reverte, means go away, as soon as possible, as far as possible, and don't come back for a very long time. So this is just a very summary of what the what the difference was between the medical doctors and the surgeons. So medical doctors, so many names, physicus, medicus, physicus, et chirurgus. They were usually um, on a contract, either one or two contract with the government, and that made them medicus salariati, they had their annual salary, they had the lodging paid, they had utility bills paid, they had everything. So what they did, the small council sent the, um, some of their sindaci or syndacus uh, to one of those uh, Italian places with a medical university to attract the physicians to come to Dubrovnik and to work there. And they had to swear an oath and, an oath on uh, the Bible to say, yes, that they will respect the contract, they will come and they will work. And of course, sometimes they even thought, you know, how to make a best bargain to be paid in advance. And they also made sure that during that year, if they were paid in advance, that they didn't, their family didn't have to return the money, the salary, in case they die. They were required to treat all the patients free of charge only if they were treat, they were asked to treat some incomers, they could receive some donation or whatever. Now with chirurgus, and they were very, very well paid. Now with chirurgus, they were also called medicus plagarum, medicus pestis. So they were normally performing some minor surgeries because there was no anesthetic only alcohol, uh, there was high mortality due to sepsis. And strangely enough, when I did the research back in my very early medical days when I was a student, I found that they were actually uh, using red wine as a very efficient uh, treatment for, for plague. I don't know if they were aware of it, <laughs> of the impact, but yes, wine was number one. Okay. Uh, so the local, the, those uh, on salary, uh, sur uh, surgeons, barbers, um, chirurgus, they were just performing minor 
um, surgeries, those that did to do the cataract, the amputation, the teeth extraction, even lithiasis from the um, urinary bladder, they were called traveling empirics because they were walking from one place to another place, so they were not bound and probably not holding much of the responsibility in case something goes wrong. So the phys physici or the doctors, they were mainly in a theoretical role, but the practical role, the hands-on, were the, the, the barbers, the, the chirurgus, and they were paid half as much as the, as the doctors. Doesn't sound very fair, does it? This is the book by uh, Zlata Blazina Tomic, a very good book uh, in where she describes about the Katsamorti and Kuga. And now we get to Katsamorti again, so many spellings, so many names, but principally they were called known as Katsamorti in Dubrovnik. And we can uh, read a lot about them in Libro dei Signori Katsamorbi a Tergo. Now, at the beginning, I said that 1390 was the year uh, when there was a plague in Rome and there were many people in Dubrovnik who happened to be there. And so that was the year when the small council uh, suggested to the grand council to actually appoint or to do something about stopping those people from Rome or actually monitor who is coming into the, into the uh, city. And so uh, the government appointed the first officinales contravenientes de locis pestiferis. So that was to stop those who are coming and officiales ad providentum supervenientibus, sorry, de locis pestiferis, means those who were offering provisions to those coming from the uh, pest infected areas. Usually it was three nobles for, and for one year. So if one Katsamorti was appointed now, six months on, another one would be appointed. So there were three at the same time, but the new lot that was coming would be appointed six months into the appointment of the, of the previous lot. Gosh, hope I may, I'm making sense. So that for the remain six months, they can learn the job. And then the first group would be dismissed and the other one would carry on. So, um, Yes, and another thing that is very clever that, that I love Dubrovnik government, because uh, if you were appointed Katsamorto, it was mandatory and you were not allowed to perform any major uh, influential or political function because they wanted to avoid concentration of power in only very small number of people. Basically to avoid oligarchy. Uh, uh, Katsamorti were authorized to apply and find of 100 ducats, and if somebody was not to pay, they were, they usually were physically, physically um, punished. 1395, six nobles were appointed, 98, five, and in early 15th century, four to six, average five in 1426, eight of them. What does that tell us? That depending on the situation, that was the frequency and the number of Katsamorti that were employed. The word per angaria means, sorry, mandatory, something like a military service, or servitium gratuitum impositum, so it was imposed. And um, in 1420, they got the title officialis Katsamortuor. Now, what were their rules and duties? prevention of plague, of course, control of entry, managing quarantine, overseeing the stuff. And that service was growing and growing. And we are now already in the 15th century. And finally, it has been recognized fully. And in 1457, so good 50 years, they got a pay rise and they have been fully funded for all their hard work, if somebody survived, of course. So in 1462, the, the Senate decided, so over time, they actually realized that those who survived the plague were never infected again. So they survived on and on and on. So they allowed 20 women plague survivors to work in uh, as a part of the Katsamortis team. And now this is interesting, 1486, 
Well, you remember those COVID passes that we had to have with how many mandatory vaccination we had? Well, they had something very similar. 1486, ships surviving in Dubrovnik had to have health certificates and they were different. Patente Libera, no plague in the port they were coming from for quite significant period of time. So Libera, free. Patente Neta, no plague in the past, for, uh, past fortnight. Patente sospetta, so there is something suspicious, maybe. And patente brutta. Brutto in Italian means ugly, horrible, means don't go there. So these were some of the Liber, um, Liber Viridis or the Green Book and the Lazaretto. So that was the monograph that is current of the current Lazaretto, the, the final complex that we saw. And this is the quarantine. Now, just very briefly, just very briefly to tell you, I, I tried to give you here the overview of how they developed and what has been going on. So the, the 1377 is the proclamation. So the first quarantines, they looked like tents or huts. And in those huts, they were mainly burning those contaminated clothing. And the, people were open in the uh, open air. Luckily, Dubrovnik has good, beautiful climate, so that's not a problem. In July 1390, remember those Roman plague and the people arriving from Dubrovnik? The minor council decided for all coming from Rome to be isolated in island of Merkan, which is just in front of Dubrovnik, in the Benedictine monastery of St. Mary, and there were some wooden huts. In 1397, Benedictine monastery in the island on, of Miet. So they were transformed in the quarantine. So we can see how this has been enlarging and building. And it's interesting, the quarantine at Danche, which is from the Pile side, so from the Western side. First, it was 1428, the first lazaretto that looked like wooden barracks. And then later they were starting to build solid buildings because they were still plagues. 1457, they added a church, a well, some family houses for the family who were suspected of having infection. Then 1482, um, so this is a good period of time. So that's already half a century, a century, a cemetery, 1496, a hospital, and it served for the next hundred years until in 1590, the decision on construction of Lazaretto at Ploce was made. And this is the complex of those 10 houses that I showed. And even though this is already 16th century, I thought it was pitiful not to show because they're really, really very interesting. And the 15 year uh, building of those uh, was from 1672 to 1642, Lazaretto et Ploce. And this is the Lazaretto et Ploce from the seaside. And if you are in Stradun, which is the main promenade, make sure you have a good coffee. Thank you so much. And to end up the way I have started, I just would like to say, gratias ago vobis pro attendere, valete omnes. Thank you. <laughs> Right, Mariana, now we have questions, I'm sure. Now you've you addressed us in very nice lingua latina to start with and so on. Uh, when was the Croatian language introduced? I mean, the language these people spoke was Italian or uh, you know, the derivative of Latin, presumably, rather than Croatian? Well, huh. uh, at this time, I mean. At that time, I believe, gosh, you, you, you caught me now. Uh, I think that some uh, form of creation was already in use, but what was important that everything that was written, so all the documents, all the uh, uh, wills and testaments, everything was in Latin. So that was like the formal language. Um, so I believe that they have already started using creation but of course in the in the different form. So Dubrovnik was also a cradle of literature and poetry in Croatia. And so the, these were already some works written in the local language at that time. You said that Croatia, um, Dubrovnik. Oh, 
gained its independence from Venice. Yes. And yeah. so presumably this was a, a sort of a nationalistic movement, you know, in Dubrovnik of Croatian speaking people wanting to be separate from Italian speaking Venice. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I think the Italian influence has been very strong. Uh, so they were under the um, Venetian uh, since 1204 until 1358, so 10 years after the Black Plague. And then there was a contract between the um, the, the Hungarian uh, King Ludo Louis I and the Venetians. And so the Venetians lost quite a bit of the coast. And that is when they were, uh, Dubrovnik in 1358 acknowledged the tributary to the, to the uh, Louis the First. However, Louis the First was in Buda, up in Hungary, so he didn't care really much. But uh, and and Dubrovnik operated very well as an independent state as long as they paid the the um, what do you call it annuity? So like mm -hmm. a, a yearly tax of I don't know how many ducats. There was quite a, a large sum, but they maintained their independence. And there is another thing that I find really fascinating, and that is the relationship between the people and the government. And the people had so much trust in the government, and the government made sure, and they were determined that they saved their people. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, how many people have trust in their government so blindly new zealanders of course <laughs> more questions but um dubrovnik republic one thing that i also um haven't mentioned so when we had when we saw the documentary i just would like to mention at the time i didn't have the uh, insight into um uh, libri statutorum de cazza mort that they cut some more to move, but uh, the ones where it uh, talks about the Katsamorti, their rules. Instead, I showed uh, because I didn't have the access to that. Instead, I showed the books of the testaments, which were also very impressive to be seen. One thing that I find really, really remarkable about Dubrovnik, and you can feel it even nowadays, it's is um, th they're because they had no land, they didn't produce any food, they depended on trade, their independence uh, from all other um, countries depended on their uh, economic power and growth. And so what they did, they developed diplomacy, and they are really diplomatic even today. They're so nice. Whenever you, wherever you go, they're so nice. They never complain. They will always welcome you. And I think that has been a legacy throughout centuries. So what they also did, they would uh, go and look for the very good quality doctors in Italy. They would bring them to, to Dubrovnik, and then they would send them to heal or to treat some of the uh, either nobles or rulers of the neighboring countries and they would then bring the news they would uh, they would act as the diplomats and it served the, the Dubrovnik government I mean brilliant sorry <laughs> did I get carried away <laughs> no, so there's some questions up here um Oh. Mariana, can you read those, please? Yes, the official language was Latin as a consequence, yes. The concept of the increasing, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so. How much of that? Move? Let's just, uh, can you comment on that first statement? Official language was Latin. Well, I, I agree. I agree. But I guess that's just a statement, isn't it? I yes. agree. Yes. Yeah, How sure. much? Oh, that's Karen. Hello, Karen. Okay. How much of that move away from Venetian was a result? How much of that of move away from Venetian influence in 1358 was a result of political social disruption caused by the initial pandemic? Well, I would say, well, Venetians weren't their friends. And so I would say that. Uh, Dubrovnik or Ragusa or Dubrovnik Republic, they have always wanted to be as independent as possible because they had their own government, they had a grand council, they had a rector, they had a small council, so they made their own decisions. As long as they kept, they kept the Venetians happy, 
I think everything was fine. And also, as I said, with um, with uh, King Louis the first. They were also fulfilling what they agreed. There was the Visegrad Agreement, I think, in 1358. But then uh, in Bosnia, when Turks, when the Ottomans came to Bosnia, so they also wanted to make sure that they are on good terms with the Turks. Um, and so they would send their, their um, uh, physicians to treat the, um, their rulers. So they actually try to do as much as possible to be on good terms with everybody. And, and that's one thing that I also um, noticed today, that they have actually, they never complain. It's very pleasant whenever whenever you walk into, it's full of people, the, the temperatures, and I was in the height of summer, the temperatures are in their high 30s, even 40s. They never complain. They are happy. They will welcome you. And then, you know, how could I complain? You know, I'm a tourist there. But... Um, Another question there. Uh, and we also got a question. Can you shut up? Completely off the subject of the foreign field of the play. Oh, no, no. All I know... Just, just about that. So what was the question again? I didn't... About answer. the cataract treatment. Cataract treatment. Cataract treatment. Cataract treatment. Okay. So uh, there were two kinds of so of um, surgeons, um, chirurgos, and so there were those one that were in town that they were uh, stationed there that they didn't want to make too many mistakes. So the other ones they were just the empiricus. So they were probably exercising this a lot and on a on a daily basis. But they were coming and going from Dubrovnik to another places. So that's how probably they got their uh, their experience. And what I found was that they were just doing treating the cataract. So I don't know anything about the procedures, anything about the the the. Uh, procedure itself but i know that they did and it has been uh, recorded yes we can start the question uh repeat the question please uh, if split split is another it's mira hello mira <laughs> um just repeat the question uh, if the uh, if split which is um, another down in center of the Dalmatia, I would say, and it's much bigger than, than Dubrovnik. Um, I know from what I know is that Split was also, the whole Dalmatian coast, Šibenik, Zadar, Dubrovnik, they were all quite affected by the Black Plague and they were much more under the Venetian influence. But what they did, I don't know. I know that um, there were some measurements, and I, I do apologize, I haven't studied split in details, but I know that, uh, for example, Milano had some very dramatic measures in 1348. If there was somebody sick in the household, they would build the wall where the door was so nobody could leave. It's pretty dramatic. And can you imagine if you, um, okay, if you die of a plague because the, the, the course of the illness was quite short, but can you imagine if you survived and then you die because you are, you are basically cemented inside the house out of hunger, starvation. Uh, another measure was, uh, it was in 1374, so slightly earlier than the um, proclamation of the quarantine, that Venetians, they stopped some ships coming into the, uh, into the city, but it was, it depended on their government whether they would let them go, uh, let them in, or how many they would let, or, so it wasn't regulated. So it was more like, oh yes, yeah, the ship is coming, we will see until Dubrovnik really decided. And, and this is a very typical Croatian thing, if I dare say. Um, we can endure things, yeah, from one time to another time to another time. But when once it's enough, then it's enough. And then it's a really, really radical change. And so, so many plagues we heard from narration. By the way, thank you very much to Catherine Williamson. She did a marvelous job. Um, it wasn't easy to pronounce our Croatian, Croatian um, names and terms. But that was something that um, I believe they 
did quite quite well. Other question? I lost the, the train of thought on that last one, but I'll get to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, you got a question. Yes. yes. Like you mentioned about the thank you. You mentioned about the trust that the people of Dubrovnik had in their leadership, and obviously they're willing to go along with uh, the measures that were put in place. Do you, did you happen to find out the reasons behind that? Was it a, I guess, a bit of authoritarian or quite an egalitarian society? Well, I think one of the things that is very strongly present, even nowadays, it's libertas. And libertans means freedom. Uh, at the beginning of the um, of the lecture, I spoke about the coincidences. I, I I come from the northern part of Croatia. I heard you at the beginning that you said I was from Dubrovnik. Actually, I'm opposite side of Croatia in the north of, and I grew up in the street that was named after one of the most famous poets, Ivan Gundulic, that is from Dubrovnik. And in one of his works, Dubravka, he starts, O lijepa, o slatka, o draga slobodo, which means, oh sweet, oh beautiful, or dear freedom. Freedom was everything to them. And so having, knowing that, gosh, unless we are united, unless we care for each other, we are going to suffer. The Venetians will, they will just swallow us. So what they did was, okay, let's do anything we can. You guys, you, you citizens, you let us do, get on with it, respect the quarantine, no breakings. Um, there was um, one of the team members or staff that were in the quarantine were uh, grave diggers or kopci or kopice, whether it was a male or female. And so uh, in the 16th century, there was a growing uh, mistrust toward those grave diggers because uh, there were suspicions that they would um, they were taking money from the dying rich in order to promise to uh, bury them properly, or uh, they were there were suspicions, and some of them were even uh, I think they were hanged. So they, they were even physically punished if they found some of the clothing from the uh, plague infect, infected rich people. And that was something that it was a big no. They were also, they were also suspected of having contacts with healthy people. And so, but, and, and, and they were dealt with. So it was a mutual trust. Yes, we want our independence. We want to be able to prosper because don't forget that in the 14th century, um, Dubrovnik alone built 200 ships. So uh, we are talking about 200 ships in uh, 100 years. So it is two ships per year. That's a lot. Merchants. Merchants, <laughs> merchants, diplomacy. <laughs> um, yes, they were they were very very wealthy. They were very wealthy. Um, it was interesting how much they paid for the for the uh, physicians. I think, let's say, if the rector received like uh, five hundred and forty florins, rector who was the the top guy, uh, 540 florins per year, the doctors at that time, they would receive probably 200, 300 florins per year, which was a lot. The other thing that, that is also very significant that um, they uh, signed the contract for a year and a half, even though there are records, particularly in this um, Zdenka Blazina Tomic's um, book there were people who worked there who were on a contract for 36 years which is really significant uh because they were so well paid uh mainly they only they were only allowed to stay a year or two depending on how bad the situation is and whether they had the doctors available 
but they didn't want them to stay for a very long time because of the accumulated wealth and they didn't want them to purchase the, the properties or um, to, to develop business. So again, they didn't want to have concentration on wealth in the hands of just very few. And that was that could be basic basis for corruption as well. Oops, oh, sorry. Questions? We'll throw no more questions. I'd like everyone to join me in thanking Mariana for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real great pleasure. Thank you.